My favorite president since I've been alive by far is John F. Kennedy. And even as a small boy in watching his inaugural speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, it inspired me. And he was always capable of giving a great speech and getting people to pull together and move forward. And he just projected dynamism and leadership in the White House. And he had his trusted confidant, his brother, Bobby Kennedy, who was his attorney general. And he had a beautiful young wife who was 12 years younger by his side. She looked up to him and she stood behind him. And she was great for taking on foreign trips because she could speak four languages. She she could speak not only English, but French, Italian, and Spanish. And he had two bright young youngsters who were a novelty in the White House. There hadn't been kids this young since going back to Grover Cleveland. And his son, John John, is long remembered for saluting his dad at his funeral on his third birthday. JFK was a family man, but he was also idolized and looked up to by a wide swath of society, men and women, all races. And and he was attractive to the most beautiful people, including Marilyn Monroe, who sang to him happy birthday on his 45th birthday at Madison Square Garden. Jackie was not there that night. Marilyn gave her last public appearance a few weeks later on her 36th birthday. And after that, she was fired by her studio for the movie she was working on, who later rehired her, I believe, but the movie was never finished. She died either late August 4th or early August 5th, 1962. And I'm showing this picture with identifying one of her publicists, Pat Newcomb, who was being led away from the scene of where Marilyn died. And that same Pat Newcomb was on a sailboat with JFK a week later across the country. JFK had his hands full, not just with celebrities and his family, but the nation. There were several major things going on. Here he's addressing the country in front of television cameras in the Oval Office about the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962. Vietnam was starting up. That was becoming a big issue. Cuba was continuously an issue for him throughout his presidency. And the right, he's pictured with Golda Meir, who was then the foreign secretary for Israel, later to become the prime minister. But there were things brewing in the Middle East as well. He also went to Europe and gave some very encouraging speeches. One was in Berlin to a huge crowd outside of the Berlin Wall. Three days later, he was in Ireland, Ireland's favorite son. This is going through Galway. And he also gave press conferences once a month throughout his presidency, something I thought all presidents would do. And it's turned out to be a rarity. No one's done it like he did it. He was very open with the press and it gave him a chance also to show his wit and wisdom and his candor, which was appreciated by the press and the general public. And he was a big favorite in our family, so much so that my brother actually drew this portrait of JFK to give to me, which I cherish. So with JFK at the helm of the ship, things were looking bright in the early 1960s. And even as early as the late 1950s, certain young individuals were trying to read the newspaper to catch up on what was going on. Then in 1962, 63, when I was in first grade, JFK was still our president, still my president. And I'll use Ron Howard and Eleanor Donahue as stand-ins for me talking to my mom the summer after first grade. My mom was getting dressed up to go somewhere, which was unusual, and I wanted to know where she was going, and she wouldn't tell me, she wouldn't tell me, and then it turned out she did tell me. She said, my first grade teacher, who I loved, had been in a car accident, and she was recovering, and she thought she was fine, but then she had a blood clot, which went to her brain, and she died. And so my mom told me that she was going to what was called a wake for my teacher. So I begged her to let me go with her. And she said, okay, but you have to get dressed up in a little suit and tie. And so I went with my mom. And it was a real shocking experience for a seven-year-old to see not only his teacher lying there in the casket who was asleep and wouldn't wake up, but one of my lasting memories too of being at the funeral home was I was the only child there, the only former student who was there. I thought maybe I'd see some of my classmates there, but no, it was all adults. And back then you could smoke 
indoors and a lot of teachers and principals and whoever were smoking and everything and laughing and I was deeply saddened so it just got me that a person I really loved and respected had passed away and people were sort of treating it very lightly. This would sort of come back to me later on sooner than I thought. So now we're on November 22nd, 1963, and every November 22nd is kind of a somber day for me. I always remember what happened on that day. So this is JFK. He started off his day in Fort Worth, Texas, and he spoke to a crowd in a light rain, and the crowd was still thrilled to see him, and he joked with them. Then he and Jackie and the whole presidential party, they took a short flight from Fort Worth to Dallas. They're only 30 miles apart, but I think he wanted to show everybody in Dallas Air Force One, which was very impressive. So he was met by a huge throng at the airport and he and Jackie got in the car and they took a ride through Dallas on their way to the convention center where JFK was going to speak at a lunchtime event. And they rode through the streets of downtown Dallas with huge crowds watching and smiling and waving. Then they made a turn on Elm Street to leave downtown Dallas to go to the convention center. Just to show you where this is, it's right at the western end of downtown and it's near the freeways. And they were going to take one of the freeways north to the convention center. So they came down Main Street and they turned short turn on Houston Street. And then you had to make a real tight turn, a very slow turn around the corner and down Elm Street. And here it is pictured, the curving road on the left is Elm Street. A man who became famous for filming what turned out to be the assassination was Abraham Zapruder, and this is the camera he used. He's being interviewed the night of the assassination at a local Dallas TV station. This is taken by another man on the other side of the street from Abraham Zapruder, and it's right before JFK was shot, and it just gets me to see all the smiling faces, especially a lot of African-American ladies standing there. Everybody was thrilled to see him. He was everybody's president. This is a shot looking back up Elm Street, and you can see some of the secret service agents. The first shot has been fired and you can't quite tell, but reportedly Kennedy had started to react from the first shot hitting him in the back of the car and the Secret Service agents are turning back to see where the shots were coming from. This is another still from the Abraham Zapruder film showing Kennedy right after he received the first shot that went through his neck and next to his throat. They say the shot wouldn't have killed him. He would have survived that, but he was hit a second time. And after he was hit a second time in the head, Jackie tried to crawl out of the car. She was trying to reach a piece of his skull or his brain that was on the back hood as a Secret Service agent. Clint Hill ran up from the car behind to get onto the car as it was picking up speed and starting to speed away. Here is Clint Hill again trying to get Jackie to go back into the car. And then he leapt over and got into the back part of the car and shielded the president who had fallen and Jackie. Clint Hill he was only 31 years old at the time and now he's 91, but total mensch for trying to handle a very, very bad situation. And this was an unusual picture I included of people who, you know, with small children, they'd fallen on the ground just to get out of the way, out of harm's way. But there were some photographer guys taking their picture while they were still laying on the ground after the presidential motorcade had passed. And this is on the grassy knoll next to the school book depository building where the shots came from. And this is another shot and one of the photographers had moved to another position to take the picture of that same family, young family, laying on the grass. So this is a picture from the Warren Commission report, and they have a circle around the window where the shots came from. Now, I once took my daughter to Dallas a long time ago when she was a young girl, and we were doing a big tour of the southern U.S., grand tour of the south, and we went to Dallas, and naturally I had to go to this Dealey Plaza and take a look at the scene for myself. Might have been there one time previously, but anyway, I really wanted to stare at things. So when you're walking around, and by the way, when we were there, it was in August and it was like 110 degrees. It was really hot. And we were walking around and there was a couple of guys selling newspapers out in the heat and that had to do with the assassination. And so, you know, I felt for the guy. And plus, I was interested in any facts I can get a hold of. So I gave him $5 for the newspaper. 
paper. I think he was thrilled. And then he told me, you know, the shots could have come from any one of these buildings. If there was more than one shooter, there could have been somebody in one of the other buildings to shoot down. And they would have a great line of sight. And I thought to myself, okay, that's another conspiracy theory. I'll put that in the back of my head. I'll keep an eye out for, for that to see what people have to say about that in the different books that I was going to read about the assassination or in the Warren Commission report itself. And it is one thing that I found never has really come up. It was never stated in things that I've read that said definitively there were no shots that came from any of the other buildings. But as you look here, these buildings are numbered and they're mostly government buildings except for one and two. So if they, somebody went up there in one of those buildings to shoot at the president at the same time that Oswald did, they might have to have passed government security, but maybe not. Back in the 60s, maybe it was much more lax. But when you read everybody's telling of the assassination and dissecting of it and everything, a lot of people have focused on where the number nine is and number 11, that a shooter, a second shooter would have been in that area. And that that's why Kennedy's head went back when he was shot in the head. But that's never really been proven and they've never found anybody who that definitely was back there. But since people were focused on the Grassy Knoll area and the number nine area, they've tended to not fully address, I think, the other buildings where there could have been a second shooter. And here's what the area looked like in the 1960s. And as you can see, it's pretty wide open. Another shot from looking up from Elm Street where Kennedy might have been shot. So you could see looking up towards that window at the school book depository building on the left that Oswald would have had to shoot over the trees and the building across the street where a second shooter potentially could have been a little further away but still very clear line of sight is the building that Abraham Zapruder actually worked in. So here's the school book depository building and this just shows the tight turn that you'd have to make from Houston to Elm Street going around the tight turn heading for the freeway. Witnesses said who were on the fifth floor that they heard the gunshots from the floor above on the sixth floor and they heard the shells hitting the floor. And it's now a museum. So they keep this window pulled up, and that's the spot right in the far corner where Oswald had his perch. And it's a well done museum. I would recommend going there. And when I took my daughter, it was educational for her. And this is the view he had looking down on the road below. And I'll just say, you can't actually go into the specific area that he shot from, but you can stand right next to it, and it's walled off by glass and you can look down and they had a narration you could listen to with headphones as you walked around and the narrator asked do you think you could hit a moving target from this angle and in my view and I don't shoot guns I have maybe once in my life once or twice when I was much younger in Boy Scouts I think I could have hit a, a target it just there's something about looking down when you're aiming at a target it's a lot easier to focus on something or hit something than it is level or shooting up. So unfortunately, it was a very advantageous position for a shooter to be in. And this is a, an exhibit from the Warren Commission report, which shows the movements of Oswald after he shot Officer Tippett, one of the police officers who was told to drive around Dallas looking for a certain suspect. They thought they had a general idea of what the suspect might look like, but he ran into Oswald and Oswald pulled out a handgun and shot him, killed him. So these are a couple of not too happy looking Dallas police officers with suspect Oswald after they arrested him in a movie theater where they caught him and brought him to the main station house pretty soon after the assassination. This is an, another iconic photo of Lyndon Baines Johnson taking the oath of office to become the next president of the U.S. with a very sad Jackie Kennedy standing next to him, still wearing the pink suit that she wore next to JFK. And Air Force One brought back his body and the whole presidential entourage back to Washington, D.C. And this is at Andrews Air Force Base in Delaware. And my mom had taken us out of school. We came 
came home before it was officially announced that JFK had died. So we were glued to the TV set for the next three, four, five, six days, maybe a whole week, watching every piece of news, the whole family. And I remember seeing LBJ get off the plane and he had to be very shaken because his predecessor had just been assassinated and he was now the president and he was trying to assure the country. But in my view, I thought this is now the president. It's no longer a young, dynamic, good looking guy, but it's this older guy. And I just was not too thrilled. So everything was really rough and raw. I mean, they sort of threw out professional decorum. It brought Kennedy's coffin down in a kind of an automated lift. And then people kind of haphazardly lifted his coffin off of the truck and put it into the back of an ambulance. And just sort of emblematic of how everybody sort of had lost their composure. Jackie, with her blood spattered dress and blood on her nylons and everything, she still had to open the door to the hearse that would take her husband's body to the morgue for the autopsy. But she was very instrumental in orchestrating his funeral, which became a much more well done affair. This is JFK's body lying in state in the White House the day after the assassination on November 23rd, very somber, with members of each of the armed forces standing guard around the coffin. But one of the things that got me, not that our family ever switched the TV from anything having to do with JFK, but a lot of college football teams still played the day after the assassination. This is Oklahoma versus Nebraska. And a lot of the colleges did cancel their games, but a lot of them went on. They continued. And the story goes that the coach of Oklahoma, who the president had appointed to be the person in charge of physical fitness for the country, President's Council on Physical Fitness, he actually called Bobby Kennedy to ask him if it would be okay if the team still played football the next day. And he supposedly, Bobby Kennedy said, yeah, sure, go ahead. But the fact that you would call the brother of an assassinated president whose brother had just died the day before in a very, very tragic way to ask him if he could play a football game just strikes me as really cold. So that's the story. So the next day on a Sunday, the president's body laid in state in the Capitol Rotunda where 250,000 people walked by in 21 hours. That means it's more than 10,000 people per hour, which is just staggering. Very somber day. But again, that didn't stop the NFL from having a football game. This is the Dallas Cowboys playing at Cleveland. And supposedly a lot of the fans yelled at the Dallas players and said, Dallas, you killed our president. And players felt miserable and everybody felt like they shouldn't have played the game afterwards, that it was disrespectful. But they still did it. They still played the game. So to me, it almost just shows you, you think professional and college sports are very commercial these days, but I think they lost their soul a long time ago, going back to the 60s and maybe even earlier. Kind of a soulless thing. So also on the same day that the Cleveland Browns were playing the Dallas Cowboys, Lee Harvey Oswald was getting shot by Jack Ruby live on TV. And I'm seven and my brother's six and we're watching this on TV. There was no time lapse. It was quite something to see. And the next day on Monday was the day of JFK's burial. Coffin was put on a catafalque and pulled by horse-drawn carriage from the White House to a funeral mass and then on to Arlington National Cemetery across the Potomac River. And this is one of the scenes that I just burned into my memory from when I was seven, watching this funeral ceremony. Still hoping that it wasn't true, that it couldn't possibly be, but it was. So this just shows you back in November 63, Thanksgiving occurred late that year. So JFK was killed on Friday the 22nd, and then he was buried on the 25th. And I'm pretty sure we did not go back to school that week because Thanksgiving was on Thursday the 28th. So we were off school. Like I mentioned, my mom came and picked us up at school the afternoon of the 22nd, and we didn't go to school until December. And I'm pretty sure our 1959 Chevrolet Brookwood station wagon sat in the driveway most of that time. Nobody really went out. Everybody just stayed inside. And in the Chicago area, there was actually snow that had already fallen. And my brother and I, we couldn't watch any more TV. This probably was the Sunday before we went back to school and we were playing football out on the yard and then we just plopped down and laid in the snow and just stared up at the gray clouds and I just thought Ugh, this is going to be the rest of my life this is terrible what happened and since then I've visited JFK's grave
grave on several occasions when I've been in Washington, D.C. Now, as I got older, maybe I was in fifth or sixth grade, sixth grade at this school, which has since been demolished. I wrote a paper, I guess, for a history class, and the title of my paper was The Assassinated Presidents of the United States and Their Assassins. What a topic for a paper. So I don't know why I wrote it. I think because I just wanted to write something about JFK and maybe also to feel like, well, at least he wasn't the only president in the U.S. that had been killed. And I hated each one of the assassins, a real Hall of Fame of losers, who brought down the leaders of our country, Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and then JFK. And it stuck with me. JFK was always my favorite, and I was honored to be able to go to a school with his name on the school. It's part of the reason I really wanted to go there. So that's where I graduated from for grad school. And then early in my career, my second job, I worked for the city of New York in the municipal building in Manhattan in the 80s. And I'll tell you a story. So while I was working there at the city of New York Office of Management and Budget, one week, the phone started to ring all the time in my office. And I worked in an open area where there were five or six other young professionals that worked with me. And it turned out that every call was for John F. Kennedy Jr. And we <laughs> thought it was amazing. Why were they all coming into my phone number? So it just rang off the hook all week long. And I have to say, everybody knew when my phone rang, it could be a call for JFK Jr. So other people that I work with, they were jumping for the phone to answer it. They wanted to talk to whoever was calling for JFK Jr. And at the end of the week, I was all alone. Everybody else had left late on a Friday. And I got a call and I go, oh, it's another call for JFK Jr., another woman calling. And it turned out it was JFK Jr. himself calling. And we had a funny call. This picture could be taken of him talking to me from another city agency. But it turned out that our lines had been crossed for some reason. So I got all his calls and he got my one or two calls. I must have got like 300 calls during the week. And anyway, I didn't want to make a big deal that I was such a fan of his dad. I didn't want to be schmaltzy like that and whatever. So we just had a good laugh. But I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll see him another time and I'll be able to tell him that I really liked his dad so much and everything. But anyway, that's my JFK Jr. story. And who knows, maybe it was Jackie O'Neill is calling at some point. Maybe Caroline Kennedy called. He was going out with Daryl Hannah at the time. Maybe she was one of the callers, but we always said we couldn't help him, that they had the wrong number and there must be some mistake. So anyway, we had a laugh and that was the end of my call with JFK Jr. So moving into the 2000s after JFK Jr. unfortunately passed away in 1999 and 9-11 happened in 2001. Looking at this calendar, it's the same setup as in 1963 with the 22nd falling on a Friday and Thanksgiving coming the next week on the following Thursday. But this is probably the start of the period I started to read some of the books that have been written about the assassination. I kind of waited for a final determination to be made by all the people who had studied the assassination and rehashing the Warren Commission report and everything, but nothing ever was definitely determined whether it was a conspiracy or not. But I started to read the books and these are just some of the books including the Warren Report itself, which actually is, I think it's well written, but others have described it as being written in kind of a haphazard way. But I've read books on both sides of the aisle, either that Oswald definitely did it or that it was a conspiracy and here's why and different conspiracy theories. And I've just kept turning it over in my own mind, going back and forth, back and forth, whether Oswald acted alone or whether it was a part of a broader conspiracy. And in doing some catch-up research just before I did this video, one of the things I kept running across was the name Edward J. Epstein. And I don't recall reading one of his books that he wrote earlier in his career, but I did order this off of Amazon. So I'll take a look at this. But one thing that was very laudable about Edward J. Epstein, he's still alive. He's now in his late 80s, but he started writing about the assassination following up on the 
Warren Commission report while he was still in college. And he interviewed everybody and he went everywhere to really turn over every stone. So I give him props for that. So I want to read what he has to say. It might be a place, if you're just starting, you might want to start with him, whereas I'm just now getting to read some of his work. So CNN ran an article earlier this year that the National Archives had concluded their review of the JFK assassination documents with 99% made public. And I'm like, what does that mean that they've concluded their review and the final 1% has not been released? So that's my big bone of contention is there must be something in this final 1% of documents that is so revealing or damaging or critical, whatever, that it has not been released yet. And I still want to see that final 1% released. I am many others. And for that reason, for a lot of reasons, but for that reason alone, I just view all the succeeding presidents as being very small in comparison to JFK. I feel like they've all missed the opportunity to release the documents, especially as time has worn on. And it just boggles the mind that they still have not released all the documents. And some of these presidents I had very high hopes for, and they still let it pass by them. Either I can't believe that a president of the United States would have disinterest and just not care about this. I just think it would be a thing that a lot of the public has been waiting and waiting and waiting for. So it's just is something that needs to be revealed. So now I'm going to talk about some of the mysteries surrounding what has been released and what's been written. And I've just distilled it down to a couple of key figures that were associated with JFK and or his assassination. So the first is Marilyn Monroe. Now, she obviously didn't have anything to do with his assassination because she died a year or so before he died at the age of 36, which I found coincidental. It was the same age that Princess Diana also lived until her tragic death. And what's interesting, a friend of mine who since passed away gave me the book he had. He goes, you should read this book. You know, you're into the Kennedys, but you should read this book, The Assassination of Marilyn Monroe. And I found it to be very interesting. And it brought up the fact that Robert F. Kennedy came to San Francisco with his family in August of 1962 on the 3rd. And he was reportedly at Marilyn's house the day she died later that night. So I don't know what that all says, but she was known to be, she could be obsessive about calling people, including in the middle of the night. And she would call, I think she called the White House, but then then she would start to be calling RFK at his office, at the Attorney General's office. And he had somewhat of a temper and he was known to yell at her. He supposedly yelled at her the night that she sang happy birthday to the president about what? No. Nobody knows. Maybe he didn't want her to go out on the stage or something. But and supposedly he was yelling at her about something the day she died. So according to people who were there. So I don't know. It just is kind of a weird part of history. And there was no Warren Commission that followed up on Marilyn's death. It was ruled a suicide. But the book makes a good case for a lot of questions or a lot of doubt about whether that was actually a suicide. Anyway. Anyway, moving on to another attractive woman, this time more JFK's age. She was only a few years younger than JFK. Mary Pinchot Meyer. And she got to know JFK and Jackie. They were lived in the same neighborhood in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. when JFK was still a senator. And so she became like a friend that way. And the picture on the right is from this picture. JFK actually came to her family's mansion, actually where her uncle lived, and it's in eastern Pennsylvania, to dedicate something that you wouldn't think a president of the United States would automatically come to dedicate, which was an Institute for Conservation Studies. But it was a big deal in eastern Pennsylvania, right on the Delaware, and the president coming, and people got all excited. And this was just a few months before his death. But he came because he knew Mary Pinchot Meyer. And it's rumored that they had an affair, but you never know. You never really know. Nobody knows for sure. And this is the mansion, Gray Towers, where the event was 
was held. And my wife and I have visited it. It's a very interesting house, some interesting design elements to it. And they have a little exhibit about when JFK came. And to hear him come and speak eloquently about an institute for conservation studies, I mean, he could just make anything sound super important and interesting. That was his way. Now, unfortunately, this is a very sad picture. Less than a year after JFK was assassinated, Mary Pinchot Meyer was murdered execution style along a walking path near her home in Washington, D.C. Very unfortunate picture. And she cried out. Someone heard her yell out, someone help me, someone help me. And then someone saw some man standing over her after he'd shot her in the back and in the temple to make sure she was dead and then got away. And one witness said it was a black man and then they found a black man who was all wet, but he wasn't the same size. He was just the same color. And they put him on trial, but they acquitted him for lack of evidence. So who knows what happened, but it is kind of unusual. So what's more unusual? Unusual, as unusual as this is, it's just as unusual that she was formerly married to Ford Meyer, who was a World War II veteran. He actually lost an eye during the war. He had a twin brother who was killed during the war, and he became a CIA agent. And I think he was involved with the Bay of Pigs, which JFK was also involved in. And supposedly his career was sort of sidetracked because of his involvement with the Bay of Pigs. And he he worked with James Angleton of the CIA, and the story goes that after Mary Pinchot Meyer was killed, a friend of hers called her sister to tell her that Mary kept a diary and she might have things about the president in her diary. So I think the sister who was married to the editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, they were neighbors also in Georgetown, and, and so was James Angleton, and the story got around that you know, there was this diary. So when Mary Meyer's sister and her husband, Ben Bradley, went to the house to look for the diary, who did they find but James Angleton trying to break into her little, she had a little artist studio, I guess, as part of her home. And anyway, somebody found the diary, but ultimately it was burned because it had potentially incriminating evidence in the diary. Again, it's uh, who really knows the story, but it just, why was a member of the CIA so intent on breaking into someone's house. It almost was comical, like the Watergate break-in, you know, where people were sort of caught red-handed. The CIA is supposed to be better than that. But anyway, why that diary could not exist, who knows? So the next person of interest is Dorothy Kilgallen, and she died mysteriously a couple years after the assassination in November of 1965. In addition to being a panelist on the very popular show, What's My Line?, she was also a syndicated news columnist, and she primarily followed the celebrities. Occasionally, she would get involved with other more serious topics, and one of those topics that she just really wanted to get to the bottom of was, why did Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald? And she supposedly had all these files. She interviewed him. She kept the files with her at all times, close at hand, and then she did a show. This is her last show, and then she supposedly after the show went to the Regency Hotel, had some drinks. I think that's the last anybody saw her. And then her house was just six blocks north of the hotel up Park Avenue on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And she was found in her five-story townhome on the third floor, a floor that she supposedly never went to. And she and her husband, they were kind of estranged, but they were still living together. Like she had her bedroom on the fourth floor and he had his bedroom on the fifth floor floor and they each saw other people and on and on and on. There's kind of a complex backstory to Dorothy Kilgallen, but she felt like she had some stuff that Jack Ruby had told her that and she was going to break that as a story that was going to really help bring things to a head as to what all was involved with the assassination. But she took a combination of sleeping pills, 
and alcohol, and that supposedly killed her. And they ruled it kind of like an accidental suicide. But supposedly the autopsy report was done from the Brooklyn office and not the Manhattan coroner's office. And the Brooklyn coroner, when he found out about this years later, he said, I never did an autopsy. I, ne I didn't write this report. So another mystery surrounding that. And they said, you know, they found her in a position fully clothed, sitting up, no suicide note or anything, no talk of having suicide. So if somebody put something in her drink or something, but they, she had like 10 times the amount of sleeping pills, the, the ingredients in her system. And she had a couple of other sleeping, you know, barbiturate type things in her system too. So it seemed very unusual. One other person of interest was Sam Giancana. And he was part of the mafia and the CIA actually had talked to the mafia about trying to assassinate Fidel Castro of Cuba and in a very far-fetched sounding plan I think involving uh, like exploding cigars or something. Anyway, it never came to pass. But the U.S. Congress in the 70s, they wanted to do follow-ups to the Warren Commission report, and they opened up two separate inquiries. And one of the conspiracy theories is that the mafia was somehow involved in JFK's assassination. And Sam Giancana was getting older, and they thought there was some talk that um, he might spill the beans or whatever. Anyway, before he went to give testimony before the House Committee on Assassinations, he was murdered gangly style in his home in Oak Park, which is just west of Chicago. Oak Park's probably more well known for being the home of Frank Lloyd Wright, where he had his home, but it's where Sam G and Kana also lived. So that kind of happened, but that could be due to other scores within the mob for why he was killed. Finally, this pair of people is probably attracted the most interest of people trying to get to the bottom of the conspiracy. The D. Morin Schultz were well-to-do people of the world who by happenstance or maybe not by happenstance met the Oswalds, Lee Harvey Oswald and his wife when they were newly back in the U.S. and befriended them in kind of a way that other people could not really understand why would such a worldly couple like this take an interest in such a, a simple, much younger couple. And Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't known for being the most agreeable type person to get along with most Russian expats. When they met him, they wound up not liking him and he was kind Kind of, they were kind of distancing themselves from him. But the DeMorenschelts still would befriend the Oswalds and bring presents for their little daughter. And it just never really totally added up. And there's some theory that they could have been Russian agents that were either wittingly or unwittingly told to keep tabs on the Oswalds since they had moved back from Russia to the U.S. And they just felt like there was more to the story. Gene DeMorenschelts and Cho was George's fourth wife. He's quite the ladies' man. And she actually, just by coincidence, and I do mean coincidence, she worked at one time for Abraham Zabruder, who shot the movie of Kennedy being assassinated. But there's some talk in one of the books I read that George DeMorenschild could have been sort of Oswald's contact person with the KGB going as far back as before he went to Russia and then reestablished contact after he came back from Russia to the U.S. So there's testimony, an interview of him by one of the Warren Commission staff members that fills up more pages than any other single person who was interviewed by the Warren Commission. So it was a very interesting story. A lot of people have tried to delve into what their real association and background was. And they were going to interview him again, and they wanted him to appear before one of those House committees that Sam Giancana was also asked to go to. And DeMorin Schell, he supposedly committed suicide before he was going to go from a self-inflicted gunshot. That's the story. So anyway, his secrets, if he had any, went to the grave with him. So now we get to Lee Harvey Oswald and some questions I have about him. Simple man. He only made it to the early 10th grade. He dropped out of school when he was in 10th grade and he was a lonely child. Mother moved him around a lot and wanted to join the Marines just to get away from his mother like his two older brothers did. And he got his one brother to sign for him so he could join the Marines at age 17. And this is him in the Marines. And while he was in the Marines, he was stationed in Japan at a big naval air base at Tsugi. And he was there from 
57 through 58, a little more than a year. And during this time, according to other people who served with him, he would spend his free time studying Russian. He wanted to learn how to speak Russian. And so he spent a lot of time to himself. And then when they had free time off base, he would sort of disappear from everybody else. And nobody knows who he hung out with. But according to one book I read, these big U.S. military bases in both Japan and Germany, there are a lot of foreign spies that sort of hover around them, kind of trying to pick off someone in the U.S. military. Really, the higher rank, the better, but they'll go with a lower rank person. And Oswald was only a private, but he was given a security clearance to work with some of the radar installations. And they had the U-2 plane that flew out of Japan, which was one of the U-2 planes was later shot down over Russia. Big deal while Kennedy was president, but he was stationed there and wanting to learn Russian while he was there. So Russian is not the easiest language to learn. And I just wanted to look up how hard is it? And there's the different schools and programs that you can use to learn Russian. They rank it in the most difficult language group for English speaking people to learn. So it's in group four. And Rocket Languages says it takes about 1,100 hours to learn it to speak fluently with Russians, which Oswald ultimately was able to do. He was able to read, write, and speak Russian, which is pretty good for someone who only has a education, not even a high school diploma. And Foreign Service Institute of the U.S. determines it takes 1,100 hours, and that would equate to about three hours every day for a year, which I don't think Oswald spent, but he probably was tutored. And my question is, who tutored him? Did the U.S. military see something in him that they thought they could teach him Russian while he was serving in active duty? There, there'd be plenty of time to do that if that was part of his work assignment. Or did he meet people when he disappeared after hours, possibly Russian people who also took it upon themselves to teach him Russian? Anyway, he got to learn Russian, which is not easy to do. And my reading of the various books, everybody just says, oh yeah, he learned Russian. Like he studied it by himself. And I'm like, he was a guy who, a terrible speller, just could not spell to save himself. And he only had an education up through ninth, early 10th grade. He was reportedly a prolific reader, but you wonder sometimes if he didn't have a dictionary with him, how would he understand half of what he was reading? But he was a voracious reader. But still, it just pushes the limits of my belief that he learned Russian all on his own. So anyway, after he was stationed in Japan, he came back and he was stationed in San Diego. And San Diego, same thing. People who served with him said, well, they would go to down to Tijuana, you know, when they had leave. And when they got there, um, Oswald said, all right, I'm going to meet some other friends. See you later. And he disappeared for the whole weekend. So nobody knows where he went, but there's one conjecture that he met up with Russian agents again in Mexico, where it was safer to meet than in the U.S. He applied to get out of the Marines and sort of on, on the early side by saying he had to tend to his ailing mother who had had an accident or something. So they let him out of the Marines early and he went back to Dallas but didn't spend much time with his ma. But instead, he went down to New Orleans where he caught a ship, a freighter ship, which other people, limited number of people would use too. They would have a couple of passenger cabins on the ship. And he took the ship to France. Le Havre, France. And it was a couple weeks and other people that were on the ship who were interviewed, they said, well, he pretty much kept to himself and everything and stayed in his own room or just did not want to be with other people. Anyway, he got to France and from there, the official story is, this map doesn't properly indicate it, but the official story is that he went to England where he then caught a flight to Helsinki, Finland, and then from Helsinki went to the Soviet Union where he wanted to become a citizen. But there's another conjecture like it can't totally be determined that he actually did that. Somebody might have picked him up in France and taken him over straight to Russia rather than having him go through Helsinki. I don't know. There's talk of having double agents or agents that were doubles of people and concocting a story that he went to England and then to Finland and everything like it was not prearranged when in fact it could have his whole trip could have been prearranged and he could have been picked up and taken directly to Russia. And this might have been more the direct line that he might have taken. But assuming he came down from Helsinki, he would come down from the north down to Moscow. And then reportedly he wanted to stay in Moscow, but reportedly he was sent to Minsk to work in a factory there. And 
Moscow is where he wanted to be, but he was in Russia from late 1959, soon after he'd gotten out of the Marines in San Diego, and was there until June 1962 when he reportedly wanted to emigrate back to the U.S. like he'd seen enough of Russia and it wasn't what he thought it would be. And this is a picture of him. I don't know whether this is in Russia or still in the United States before he went to Russia. But he's a young man. He's like 20 years old, already getting out of the Marines. And Khrushchev was the president of Russia back then. And in the 50s and 60s, everything was pretty rough, still is. But Khrushchev was no fan of JFK. And poorly, he would also refer to JFK is the pig and talked about wanting to get rid of JFK and you know especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis when Russia backed down and they felt like they lost face and turned their missiles around and brought them back to Russia he felt humiliated and he really wanted to get JFK but again who really knows the real story especially on the Russian side of things but this is the building that Oswald supposedly lived in which was a fairly high class building that the Russian government put him up in, which is pretty nice. They did better for him than the average Russian person. And he met and got married to a young Russian woman two years younger than him, Marina, and they quickly had a baby in Russia. This is them with relatives. And I have to say, in a lot of the pictures, all the pictures with Marina, she's never smiling. Maybe she has bad teeth, but maybe she wasn't that happy either. I'm not sure. Here they are at a park with one of her aunts. And here he is with some of his workmates in Minsk. So Marina is still alive. She's 82, an American citizen living in Texas. So when they met in March 1961, they had a whirlwind courtship and they were married six weeks later when Oswald was 21 and she was only 19. So, And then it seems to be a standard line of his. He got to the point where he said, I've had enough. He would always say that I've had enough. So nothing doing. He wanted to go back to the U.S. and he had sort of quasi tried to renounce his American citizenship, but it was never never fully taken away from him or he never became a Russian citizen, but they gave him his passport back, the U.S. Embassy. And not only that, they gave him a loan. He had no money. So they gave him a loan to fly him and his wife and his young daughter back to the U.S. And I don't know, from what we know about Oswald, maybe the Russians felt like, you, it's okay, we don't want you. Go back to the U.S. So anyway, they immigrated back in June of 1962, really the world travelers at a young age. And when they got back to the U.S., he, they bounced around. He had no money. He never could seem to hold a job, and he only would take low-paying jobs. And he would go to the employment office for jobs, and if they didn't have anything, they didn't have anything. It's not like he went and knocked on doors and or would work at a fast food restaurant. If there were fast food restaurants, maybe they were just sort of starting up in the early 1960s. But anyway, he seemed to only get his jobs through the employment commissions of either Texas or Louisiana. So, but in early 1963, at a party of Russian expats, Oswald and Marina were invited, and so was Ruth Payne, who was a woman who knew people in the Russian community, and she was trying to learn Russian. She had been trying to learn it since 1957, but for her to really get better at speaking Russian, she wanted to do it for world peace and, you know, connecting the two societies so that there would be less discord in the world. Very altruistic woman of, who was a Quaker, is a Quaker. She's still alive. She's in her early 90s now. Um, she, after meeting the Oswalds and discovering that Marina only spoke Russian, she didn't speak any English, and learned their story about them bouncing around and everything, not really having any roots set down in Texas, she offered to take Marina and her kids into her home like a couple of months after meeting the Oswalds. And so this was in Irving, Texas, near Dallas. And he would, Oswald would live in a rooming house or he'd go to New Orleans looking for work and be there for a while. And she would let him come and stay with his wife and their daughter in her house on weekends. But during the week, she kind of didn't want him around. She didn't particularly care for him, just like everybody else didn't really care for him. And she saw that this young Russian woman's situation was kind of unfortunate because he wasn't the easiest person to get along with and everything and would order her around and wouldn't 
let his wife learn English. He didn't want her to learn English. So anyway, she felt for young Marina, but it was pretty something, a relatively small house. And Ruth Payne was going through a divorce from her husband. They had two kids. She had two small kids of her own. And then to take another woman in their house who had a young daughter and was also pregnant with a second child who would be born and also stay in the house with them. It got pretty crowded. On top of that, like Oswald would give up hope of finding a job in Dallas. So he he had family in New Orleans. So he'd go there. And then Ruth Payne would, out of her time, she would drive either, either all of them or just Marina to New Orleans and then back from New Orleans. And she did a three or four round trips between New Orleans and Dallas. And that's a long drive. It's 200 miles. But that was eight to 10 hours back in the day. And it was a slow go. So the fact that she had her own small kids was going through a divorce. I don't know if she had a job too. I don't think so. I don't see how she'd have time for it. But just going back and forth between New Orleans and Fort Worth was something that she was willing to do that. So she seems above board. But one of the things that conspiracy theorists have picked up on or question is just that in their meetings with the Warren Commission and also later on, their stories, Ruth Payne's and her ex-husband, Michael Payne, and Marina, they would, their stories didn't always hold up or they would change over time. You know, key facts were misremembered or changed or whatever. So there's always some question as to whether they were being totally truthful about everything they knew. And supposedly Ruth Payne, the FBI would come around and she would kind of sort of misdirect them about Oswald, his whereabouts, sort of to protect him or whatever. And so having said all that, you would think that Marina, who Oswald would have um, been really thankful for everything that Ruth Payne did for her. But after the assassination, they had a falling out and Marina Oswald thought that Ruth Payne was trying to grab too much attention to herself. So it's just a question of what really transpired back then in the 60s. So when Oswald was in New Orleans, Ruth Payne came and picked up Marina and her small daughter and brought them back to Dallas. And then Oswald took buses to get down to Mexico City. And the story goes that he wanted to go to Cuba, get a visa to go to Cuba, and felt like you could do it from Mexico as opposed to the U.S. And then from Cuba, he wanted to go back to Russia. Like now he was had all he could take of the U.S. again. So he wanted to go back to Russia. So he went down to Mexico City, which is a whole story in itself. And there's a lot of doubts raised by why he really went there. And then he came back to Dallas on the bus, took the bus everywhere. And then, as we know, he was in Dallas on November 22nd when JFK was there. And this was, I thought the picture on the left was an unusual one in that I guess a city bus was either stuck in traffic by the huge crowds or whatever, but it just seemed like a real security problem from the get-go coming down the streets of Dallas. And then, as we all remember, even when I was very young, I remember Walter Cronkite coming on TV and announcing that the president had died. So getting back to Jack Ruby, as a young kid with my brother watching, and my parents watching Lee Harvey Oswald shot, just, I had not watched a lot of gangster movies before that, but it just looked gangsterish. Kind of a guy in a 1940s hat and suit shooting someone. I don't know. That's just the way it looked to me. Like there was something nefarious. It wasn't altruistic, like somebody, somebody getting Oswald because he deserved it, even though most Americans probably felt he did deserve it. But so Jack Ruby, everyone knows, is who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. And when he was in prison and was being tried and then he was acquitted and then he was going to be retried. Anyway, in late 1966, actually December of 66, he was diagnosed with cancer and then boom, January he died. And it was like the fastest cancer anyone had ever heard of. So that aroused suspicion. That was he poisoned or something to generate his cancer? That's such a quick moving cancer. And he died at age 55. So the reasons he gave were reasons that most Americans could relate to. And that he didn't want Jackie Kennedy to have to come back and testify at a trial. Although he later supposedly was told to say that by one of his lawyers. And he wanted to show that Jews could be tough and not take it from punks like Oswald. That's totally understandable and believable. But he also had connections with Cuba. And the backstory here is that he was involved with some kind of smuggling into Cuba and taking one known trip, but also probably other trips in the middle of the night that were not recorded. So did he owe Cuba any favors? Was there anything related to Cuba? Another possible culprit in the Kennedy assassination? No one knows. And the Warren Commission, which was commissioned a week after the assassination, 
information, they tried to get to the bottom of it. But an Earl Warren, the Supreme Court justice who was the head of the commission, he interviewed Ruby himself. But Ruby felt like he had stuff he could tell Warren, but not in Dallas. He felt like he had to be brought back to Washington, D.C. in order to tell him what was really going on. And supposedly that's what Dorothy Kilgallen got Ruby to tell him. But nobody knows what it was that Ruby really had to say that was so important he couldn't tell Warren directly when Warren came and met him in Dallas and in the prison. So these are some of the members of the Warren Commission that were the staff people, and they were all top lawyers, young lawyers, mostly in their 30s, some in their 40s, and they did a yeoman's job of trying to really sift through a lot of things. And I, the more I read about the staff members of the Warren Commission, the more impressed I was, particularly with Arlen Specter. I thought he really did his work, and one of the things I read was that not all the members of the Warren Commission staff were as hardworking and were sort of itching to get out of the assignment and go back to their regular work lives. And I'm thinking, well, what else could be more important than what they were working on to determine definitively what happened? But maybe some of them felt Oswald did it. There was no conspiracy. And what more could they do? They could keep chasing other things down. But ultimately, that's the overall conclusion that the Warren Commission reached. And they felt like they had the answer. So why keep uh, going back and forth over it? But the commission kept asking for extensions and was trying to do their job. But a lot was going on in the world. Uh, the same month that Kennedy was assassinated, this very popular movie came out and people were laughing and watching this movie. And then in the early months of 1964, it's when the Beatles arrived. So there's another major distraction and that was taking America by storm. And the Kennedy assassination just a couple months prior was already starting to fade away into history. And following up the Beatles, another very popular group, the Beach Boys, started to really come on the scene and become really fabulously popular. So you had all this music going on while the Warren Commission was working away trying to determine what really happened. And then 10 months after the assassination, they gave their report to President Johnson. And some of the members of the commission I thought were of particular note. One was John McCloy. He's the man standing on the left. And he, from what I read, really was taking the whole thing seriously. Some of the other members of the commission, they would come to overall meetings, but they weren't so involved. They left it to the staff people to be involved. Involved, but John McCloy, interesting person to read, his background, high-powered background, advisor to various presidents, and just a top-notch guy. Anyway, he was one real stalwart on the commission. Another member of the commission later to become a U.S. president was Gerald Ford, pictured on the bottom at the right, second one in from the right. And he was a congressman and member of the opposite party from Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson had Republicans and Democrats on the commission. And he kind of took it upon himself when I've read to sort of let the FBI and the CIA know what the commission was coming up with before the report was released, kind of taking it upon himself to be the liaison with those agencies. And another commission member was Alan Dulles. He was a former CIA director. He's the man wearing the bow tie. He's a former CIA director and Kennedy actually fired him after the botched Bay of Pigs fiasco in early 1961. But Johnson still wanted him on the Warren Commission. And so he was a former member of the CIA, still with ties to the CIA, who was on the commission itself. And a lot of people feel that the CIA could have been involved somehow in the assassination. And so to have someone from the CIA on the commission itself kind of helped uh, deflate the objectivity of the commission. Who knows? Another member of the commission is was one of the youngest members, along with Gerald Ford, was Hale Boggs. And he's pictured on the lower right and on the far right of the group picture. And he was a doubter of the overall conclusion. He was kind of one of the dissenting members, but he agreed to sign the commission's report that the overall conclusion was that there was no conspiracy and that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter. But he had his doubts, and he was later killed in a plane crash in Alaska. He was helping someone campaign up there, and their plane actually disappeared and was never found. So you can call that mysterious, but not, not that mysterious. Pretty mysterious. So And then finally, there's the picture of Earl Warren and his wife with President and Mrs. Kennedy, and it was like a month before Kennedy was assassinated. So what a difference a month makes, you know, you're with the Kennedys one month and the next month you're appointed to head up a commission to study why JFK was assassinated. And he was a former governor of California and then the head of the Supreme Court, so really distinguished. LBJ could not have asked for a better person with a better reputation than Earl Warren to head the commission. But Earl Warren was busy just like everybody else was. So he didn't, most of the members resisted being on the commission because 
because they had other commitments, but OBJ needed to have high-ranking people on this commission, so he had to ask them to do double duty. So since the commission's report came out, people started doubting the commission. They felt like they didn't talk to all the people that they should have. They didn't always ask the right questions or delve deeply enough into the assassination. So these are some of the main conspiracy theorists, and I don't think that people who don't believe in conspiracies or that a conspiracy happened involving the JFK assassination, that they should gaslight the people who do have questions. I think their questions are legitimate, and I think nobody has all the facts, so people have tried to postulate as far as they can what really could have happened, hoping that something by their sort of muckraking will come up as a result of their investigations that might break the whole thing open and have all the facts laid bare. But since all the details have not been released by the National Archives, which is controlled by the president, we don't know all the facts, so nobody knows all the facts. And even after the, if the 1% of details are ever finally released, they still probably won't be known, but there's got to be something in that last 1% that there's some reason why it's still being withheld. So Mark Lane was one of the main conspiracy theorists. He wrote several books, a couple of which I've read, and he makes a good case, raises a lot of good questions, doesn't quite nail it. Nobody does, but he gave it a good shot. He lived till he was 89, passed away a couple years ago. Oliver Stone produced the movie that I thought was a very good attempt to determine what actually happened JFK. He has since been criticized for bending the facts, trying to rewrite history, but again, I think he's a very intelligent guy, well-spoken, very thoughtful, and I think he was trying to give it a good shot to see what could come out of doing a movie. Would, would facts come to light as a result of him producing the movie? So I give him props for that. And Cyril Wecht, God bless him, he's 92 now. He's been He's a former coroner for Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, and he's been on TV over the years and on various cases, but he's never given up trying to find out what really happened with the Kennedy assassination and came out with a book not too long ago. I've read it, well written, almost gets there. He might do the same thing that some of the non-conspiracy theorists do, which is he might tend to gaslight the non-conspiracy theorists, but I think everybody's just got to like, you know, treat everybody else like they're making an honest effort, whether you are on one side of the equation or the not. So I give him props for being so dogmatic over the years, and I hope he lives until he's at least 102, and he'll see the light of what he's been trying to expose before he moves on. And then these are some other books. I thought this book by Howard Willens, who was one of the staff members on the Warren Commission, talked about what it was like and that he felt like the Warren Commission came up with the right conclusion. Very level-headed, uh, believable book. Vincent Bugliosi, former DA in LA, wrote a huge book, probably the thickest book I've read, really goes through the entire history of the whole Kennedy assassination. Excellent book. He concludes that Oswald was a nut and did it himself, but he didn't answer some of the questions I had, for example, how Oswald learned Russian the way he did, how he was able to become very fluent at it. Some say he spoke rough Russian, others said he did quite well, So, but he read it also and wrote it. So amazing that he did that all on his own. I don't think he did. And then one of the most recent books I've read was by an author who just recently passed away of COVID into in his 90s. And Ian Pesepa is from Romania, and he was in their sort of KGB-like organization there that worked a lot with the intelligence community from the USSR and other Eastern Bloc countries before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And he defected to the U.S. And he's told stories from what people suspected on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And very interesting. He has to, again, use a lot of conjecture. But after the Kennedy assassination, he said a lot of them looked at each other and they go, well, we think the KGB was involved. They just, there were things that spoke to him and others in his community that something like that, somehow the KGB was involved. And there's various acronyms, different, it's not the KGB, it's other acronyms for other organizations that are like the CIA and the NSA in Russia. So very perceptive book. I think it was a really interesting read and he gives a good timeline at the end of his book as to all the different things that happen and you can just sort of take the puzzle pieces apart and put them back together again and see if it makes sense. So now we're at the end, but I just like to say that it's apparent that current president Joe Biden is not going to release the final 1% of documents the previous presidents did, didn't also, who I had high hopes for. And I think it's going to take the next president to hopefully finally release the final 1% of the documents that might yield 99% of the real answers, because we've been going on what the initial 99% has said and what 
other people have discovered through other documents and interviews. And who knows, the next president might be have to have to be another Kennedy. There's Bobby Kennedy Jr. who is running. He's a dark horse. He's a long shot. But who knows? I think he would release them on his second day, if not his first day, on upon taking office. And this is yours truly having his picture taken with Bobby Jr. a couple of decades ago. So the last 1% of documents are in the National Archives, right between the Capitol and the White House. If I was the president, I'd give my inaugural speech, walk over to the National Archives, tell them to release the last 1%, and then go to the White House. And I'd have really good Secret Service protection the whole time. So thanks for watching. I know it's been a long video, but I felt like I've read a lot and really have tried to get to the bottom of things. And I just want to make a pitch again. It's been 60 years now since JFK was assassinated. I think it's time. It's long past time for that final 1% of documents to be released. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.